going on beyond all this, um, I really want to talk about um, a guy who's been getting a lot of attention, and I would say rightly so, over the course of the last few weeks. And this, of course, is Aaron Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz is quite an amazing guy, quite an incredible guy. He's an, basically an American computer programmer, writer, political organizer, and internet activist. And um, he was participating in uh, developing uh, very much used, very popular uh, internet sites such as Reddit. He was largely responsible for developing that. And uh, the RSS feed, which I'm sure many of you have used if you, you go online uh, and, uh, and basically try to get your news off RSS feed. So, so he, he was involved, and like, he was just a teenager when we helped develop these, uh, these kind of uh, internet tools, which are now very, very mainstream. But um, the reason why he's come to attention, he's garnered so much attention recently, is because he, of course, committed suicide. And really, the circumstances of his suicide say so much about certainly the United States, how the legal system operates under, under a, um, in a capitalist society. Because Aaron Schwartz was a longtime activist. He was involved in uh, many of the protests surrounding the, uh, um, many of you will have heard of uh, SOPA, PIPA, the, uh, the various bills which have been, um, over the past few years, been raised in the, uh, the U.S. Congress. You know, supposedly to go after online piracy, but which have largely clamped down, would have had the effect of clamping down big time on internet freedom. And on the freedom of information in general. And could have led to the wholesale privatization of the internet. And uh, just turning it into a totally uh, for-profit place where there's no free access to information at all. And there was a whole protest movement against those bills and those bills were defeated. And Aaron Schwartz was one of the big um, um, activists who uh, was behind that campaign. And fighting, against the, uh, fighting for the freedom of information on the internet. And uh, certainly he was involved in, in several um, activist uh, groups such as uh, Demand Progress, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, like these, these various uh, groups that he was a part of. And uh, he was involved in, as a supporter of freedom of information, what he tried to do is he tried to get access to various informa like information that he thought should be made public free of charge, but which was being held in private databases and and um, and basically used for profit, usually by some sort of corporation, but even by the um, by certain American uh, American um, American government institutions, such as the Library of Congress. So, for example, in 2006, he like Aaron Schwartz actually downloaded the entire Library of Congress's bibliographic data set, which the library had been charging fees to access, even though it's like it's public info in the United States, like the the contents of the Library of Congress. But they had been trying to charge charge money for it, even though it wasn't copyright protected. It wasn't even copyright protected. But what, so what Swartz basically acquired that and put it online, so now it's free for everyone to access. And that's largely what he did. Like, he has a pretty large track, long track record of doing this. Um, so, uh, downloading and release approximately 20% of the public access to uh, court electronic records that the, uh, the United States federal court system uh, was, uh, was maintaining. And uh, which, of course, they they tried to be charging, been charging money for as well, even though it wasn't copyrighted material and should have been made free uh, free access to the public as well. But what really got him in trouble, and this is where the the U.S. justice system really tried to shut him down, and this, in fact, is what led to his suicide, was that in late 2010 and early 2011, uh, Schwartz downloaded about four million of JSTOR's collection of academic journal articles. And, and seeing this is the University of Guelph, many of you will know what JSTOR is. JSTOR is basically an online database, uh, a for-profit database. I mean, they charge a lot of money for uh, individuals and organizations to access that database. And um, 
it basically is journal articles and uh, various academic writings that uh, that are on on JSTOR. So he da- he downloaded those, and um, at the time he was a faculty member at uh, Harvard University. He was a researcher there, and that provided him with a JSTOR account. So over the course of a few weeks, he downloaded the documents from a uh, all the four million documents that he downloaded from a network wiring closet at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And um, the reason why he did this was um, ultimately because he did not believe that these kind of articles, these academic articles, and um, should be kept from the public, that this sort of inf- information should be out there, that people should be, a- be able to access this you know, free of charge. And also, he very much disagreed with JSTOR's policy of paying publishers for the articles that they um, that they include in the database, but not authors. So if you if you actually write a journal article that ends up on JSTOR, you don't get any money for that. Only the people who published that originally published that article will get money for it. So um, basically, he disagreed with the, the fact that the creators are not getting credit for the work that they did. He disagreed with that as well, and that's another reason why he did it. But even though JSTOR itself was against prosecuting him. You know, for something which his defense uh, basically said is almost like going to a... um, um, The direct quote was, this makes no sense. It's like uh, trying to put someone in jail for allegedly checking too many books out of the library. Because the U.S. prosecution was going to give him about 30 years. They were trying to put him in jail for 30 years for downloading those articles off of JSTOR. And it was largely because of the unrelenting pressure on him from that pro- from the prosecution, which just went after him on so many levels. You know, harassed him, um, just checked up on his personal life, just you know, went after him in, in all kinds of different ways, and uh, was just unrelenting. That's largely that is seems to be the reason why he committed suicide at the age of twenty six. Now, one of the things which I, I said I was going to talk about is why is the, does this matter in the, con- the broader context of the capitalist system, which we've analyzed so many times on this show? And I would say the reason why it matters is because capitalism fundamentally is not about freedom of information. It is about the exclusive control of information. And using that exclusive control to make profit. So, for example, a corporation, say Coca-Cola, has exclusive control over the recipe to make Coca-Cola. And it uses that exclusive control to make a profit for itself. If that recipe was free to, free to access, anybody could use it. That would undermine their bottom line. And of course, they're totally against that. And it's the same thing with just about anything. You know, like whether we're talking about like Microsoft or like, uh, or Apple or any of these other, um, or uh, basically any corporation. All these things rely. The, the entire profit motive basically relies on the exclusive control of information. Whether it relates to a product or a service or whatever. That's the basis of trade secrets and copyright law. And like I said, it's it's the basis of the profit motive. The profit motive demands that you, as a profiteer, as a capitalist, have control, exclusive rights to what it is you're selling. And in order to have that exclusive control, you have to control the information. There can be no freedom of information. And it's that, that profit motive that ultimately killed Aaron Schwartz. Because, and we know this, like, the United States government has a huge track record of this. They're the biggest in force of copyright law around the world. Not just in the United States, but around the world. And why did they do that? 
Because the United States is the biggest capitalist state in the world. Effectively defends the interests of, the, of basically the, the capitalist system. The entire capitalist system. And you bet it sees guys like Aaron Schwartz as a threat. Who are campaigning for free access, free information. You know, going into databases and, you know, taking articles that would originally be made public only if you paid a lot of money for them and just making it free access to that anybody can look at. You know, that's unforgivable. Looked at from the perspective of the corporations and the governments that basically support these corporations and serve their interests. And certainly the government and a lot of these... So even, even if JSTOR backs out and says, we don't want to prosecute... We see the government goes ahead with it, with the prosecution, because it knows, as the guardian of the entire capitalist system, if Schwartz gets off, if he gets away with this, regardless of how minor it is, look at the precedent that sets. That unravels the very basis of the profit motive, freedom of information. They understand that. So that's why they want to they just shut Aaron down. They want to send him to, send him away to prison for 30 years. Wreck his life. Because that sends a message. And it's the same reason why they ruthlessly prosecute copyright law. And just throw the book at anybody who, uh, who say, downloads uh, music for free off the internet. Or downloads movies for free off the internet and stuff like that. You know, they... They cannot tolerate that. And the reason why they can't tolerate that is because the very basis of capitalism is the exclusive control of information. It's not freedom of information. It's not free exchange of information. It's monopoly control of information. That's the basis of the profit motive. That's the basis of capitalism. And that's why they decided to throw the book at Aaron Schwartz. So Aaron Schwartz might not even known it, but he was a part of the class struggle. Because the fight for freedom of information, you betcha it's part of the class struggle. Because the reason why the capitalists are fighting back tooth and nail against freedom of information and for the tightening of crop- copyright law, like in the United States and around the world, and the reason why governments are going along with that You know, and trying again and again and again, in spite of major public opposition, to tighten copyright law and make it so the internet is like the exclusive, is, you know, just exclusively controlled by corporations and by the profit motive and run according to the profit motive is because of the fundamental nature of what capitalism is. So you bet it's part of the class struggle, brothers and sisters. And this is why the case of Aaron Schwartz matters so much. And this is why I'm talking about it here tonight. 